Mr. Cornforth, welcome to Scotland. Thank you, mate. It's been a long time coming. We've been talking about this for what feels like years. Most of our lives from 1995. Yeah. Onwards. <laughs> you had to really think about what age you were on the car, didn't you? I did, yeah, yeah. I what just got an accountant this week uh, and I, yeah. Don't and really she know. needs to account for your age? Everything. Is that what you're saying? Everything. I'm outsourcing <laughs> age management. Yeah. I am clueless uh, as to what's going on in my life, but it's going well, so I'm happy. <laughs> and that will be the subject of today's conversation. So I think there is a lot of comedy on the internet these days. Mm -hmm. You have a niche within it, which is essentially yeah. fitness and then just occasionally just utter chaos. Yeah. The uh, what, what, was the, what was the trend where you smeared a mushed up Jaffa cake on your face? Never the, let them guess your next the move. Trend, the trend that you won. You, you won, effectively, I'm saying that boldly. Thank Sam, you. Sam won that trend. Yeah. And th th there is a niche that you own, but I believe that there is much more to Sam Cornforth mm -hmm. than people might see online. And I think that's part of the wider problem with social media in general. But I think for you especially, there is a very deep thinker, a very calculated action taker based on the point conversation we've just had beforehand. And I would like to explore that today. So Lovely. your thespian upbringing, talk yes. us through it. Were you, were you always, always wanting to act? I know your mum had a background in acting. Yeah. Talk, talk us through your, your thespian childhood. So, uh, thank you for having me, by the way. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I grew up in Devon in a village and pantomimes were a big thing in our village. Um, and I never really knew what I wanted to do in my life. I dabbled in every sport you can think of. And my family, bless them, bought every kit for every sport. Um, tried rugby, didn't like how the gum shield felt in my mouth. So I stopped that. Um, tried tennis, didn't like being sweaty. So I stopped. Um, golf was boring. <laughs> so I stopped. I did everything. And the most enjoyment I got was dressing up as like a woman or a star in the nativity or something. Big role. Big role. Big role. Big role and a big star. My mum made a huge cardboard star and I had really chubby cheeks. And I remember standing in the middle of the pews like this and she made this hole too small for my head. So my cheeks were like this and I was trying not to smile too much because I was, I was method acting. I'm a star. Of course. Of course. Smile. Yeah, stars don't smile, do they? No. no. Um, but anyway, I uh, did a lot of pantomime and really enjoyed like positive reinforcement you get from a, a loud audience clapping, laughing along with you. Um, and during all this time, my mum uh, had to drop out of drama school. She went to Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, but sadly, not sadly, I was about to say, sadly had my sister. <laughs> she sadly had my sister uh, and had to drop out. Um, so she had a background in acting as well. Um, and we'd sit there and watch TV and she'd be on like Holby City, Casualty, Doctor Who, running away from Daleks and stuff like that. And I was like, this is a dream, like watching your mum who you love on shows on the, you on love. The, on the telly. Yeah, she's literally on running away from Cybermen. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, that is obscene. Like it's, so it was very much ingrained in me that like that was a possibility. Being on TV, being in front of an audience was a possibility. What was it that drew you to that? at that age though, because an audience, a screen, you're exposed. Mm -hmm. And most people at that age are very insular and don't want to feel exposed to those around them because it, mm. I mean, growing up is chaotic for everybody. Yeah. People obviously have different stories to tell and different journeys they've been on, but yeah. we all we all protect ourselves as we mm -hmm. learn what's going on in the world. So what what was the what was the core of that desire? Did you was it were you an attention seeking child? Were I, you yeah. were you just inspired by the art? Was the method acting of being a star so incredibly profound that you decided, you know what, I'm going to upgrade to being a tree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, my defense mechanism throughout my like early adolescence and beforehand, but like even from like being like a toddler, like from like a very very young age, I was like a bit of a chubbier kid, um, and I feel like. If I made a fool of myself before people made jokes about me, then I beat them to it. I've already done it. So you can't make fun of me because I make, I'll make more fun of myself. So if I always entertain people and made them laugh and, to my own detriment, um, they wouldn't bully me. <laughs> Literally, that is as plain as it gets. Like, was it ever a reality or was it just a protective mechanism? Was it preemptive mechanism? Preemptive. Okay. And there were times that like, I felt like I, I did get bullied when I was younger, like uh, when I went to secondary school. Um, but a lot of it was my own fault, just being a bit too like egotistical and like uh, going off the popularity I had at primary school 
with four people in my year <laughs> to then go to a secondary school with 200 uh, who are all from different villages and we've never met each other before. Um, so it was preemptive. I, I made a fool of myself before anyone else could make a fool of me. Um, and I liked the feeling of making people laugh and that was always in my life. And I, my dad used to put on TV like Lee Evans at Christmas time and we'd watch Stand Up Together and uh, uh, Tommy Cooper and all that. And we'd watch those things together. And I just loved the feeling of watching someone on stage giving everything to give you a good, to, to make you feel good and warm inside. Like watching Lee Evans dripping of sweat in a oh, suit yeah. on stage, doing like funny faces and taking the mick out of his wife and stuff. And you're like, it was just so funny. And I couldn't, I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and just seeing my mum on TV again, made it a possibility that maybe that could be me one day. Um, and then, yeah, I, uh, uh, actually, funny story. I uh, was courting this girl a, the year below me in uh, sixth form. And uh, I knew she liked uh, musicals. I didn't. But I was like, if I'm going to see this girl, maybe I should audition for a musical. And I, all I wanted was a chorus role because I wanted to be in the background, just giving it, giving it everything, giving it source, absolute source in the background. And some people None of like, this static star stuff. No, no. We're level, we're level two now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've got, got, got some XP and I'm ready to prestige. Um, and uh, I uh, auditioned for the for a show called Sherlock Holmes, The Revenge of Sherlock Holmes. And I just wanted to be like apples and pears in the background. I didn't have a mustache at the time. Oh, no. well, yeah, got it. It would have been perfect. Um, but I just wanted to be like a little cockney geezer in the background. And that's all I wanted, like top hat, trill, be whatever. Um, I got Sherlock. So I literally got Sherlock Holmes and I had no singing experience, never sung in front of everyone, anyone in my life um, and was not very confident. <laughs> uh, but I got the part of Sherlock Holmes and I was like, oh shit. And then they started putting me in touch with like, this opera singer man. And I had to go to like these opera classes. Um, and all of this was just to flirt with this girl. <laughs> but I was in a like three week or two week run of this show in Devon as Sherlock Holmes. Um, yeah, literally just flirting with a girl. Uh, but did, I enjoyed it. Did did it work? I loved it. Was the court? No, no, no. The courtship. Oh, it worked. Yeah, it worked oh, really it worked. well. Okay, yeah, okay. it worked okay, really well. Okay. And you accidentally found a love for theatre. Yeah, the way. exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, no downsides. No, literally no. only positives. Uh, and it went really well. Um, not a good singer, but I could hold a note loud. It's basically loud talking. I was just loudly talking. Um, and it went well, and I loved it. And after that, my mum was like, "I haven't seen you like that." And this was around the end of sixth form for me. And so I was like, I really need to start looking at unis. Um, and I was doing English language, uh, drama and graphic design. So I was like, I love tech. I love making soundscapes. I love doing sound design. I love drama because it was a DOS class for me. It was like, it was one that I could just turn up, make a fool of myself and they go, oh, there's an A. And I'm like, well, that was easy. Yeah. Um, and then English language is just interesting to learn about like Shakespeare and other contemporary artists and writers and things. Um, so I thought, what do I need to do? What, what, what should I do for uni? And then that's when I uh, decided that I'm just going to throw all my eggs into one basket and try acting. Which was then essentially, it was almost like a, it was a, it was a, a, a scheme you got into? A, yeah, a, yeah, like a yeah, theater like... company. So it was like a, a repertoire theater company. So I did audition for like Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. I did audition for RADA. Which is where your mum went. Mum went it? to yeah, Royal yeah, Welsh, yeah. yeah. Um, but the syllabuses themselves, the contact hours aren't very high. It's very much like a uni course. Right. Um, there are some written elements to it. And the written side of drama for me was like, it felt like a waste of time when they're like, how would you create comedy in scene three of two? And you just have to rewrite the question and then fill in the gaps. And it was like, there was more technicalities around how to answer the question than the genuine comedy answer. Like how, whatever your answer, it doesn't really matter what your answer is, as long as you answer it, how they want you to answer it. And it's, I didn't yeah. like it. Yeah. So I was like, I don't want to do anything I, like theory based. Um, and I found this company called fourth monkey and for 40 hours a week for two full years, you train with them and they cherry pick different practitioners from RADA, Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, Central, um, Guildhall, all these established accredited schools. And they basically just cherry pick people that have a little bit of free time and they're very, very talented in their field. Voice coaches, uh, clown coaches, commedia dell'arte, Italian coaches, um, mime coaches. And it's a very physical course. Um, so you do sweat a lot. And it was like, you're doing Lee Evans style training, essentially, which was my dream. So I did that for two years 
uh, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, was there an element you enjoyed the most? Yeah, weird. Uh, the clowning. The clowning was amazing. Um, My assumption would have been mime because... Really? Yeah, I, what I find profoundly well executed mm. in your videos is how you can bring so much comedy to very few words with mm. facial expressions yeah. and just emotions conveyed through yeah yeah it's what well, is essentially mime it's not yeah what we're all thinking now which is the sort of i know you're thinking yeah person the shell ha hand, oh, but oh, mime, oh, yeah. i'm right thinking mime is essentially that the communication of language through through yeah no no words that's yeah, kind of it's, how i view it's, its definition it's more physical than you'd actually think like we in a mime class they would uh get your bags make a big square in the middle of this hall and then you'd all stand in this square and um, it was always like telling a story through stillness. So not even using facial expressions. Mm, okay. So they, the practitioner was called Guillaume, lovely bloke, very handsome fr French man, loved getting changed in front of us. It was you're a bit weird. Telling me a French man was teaching the mime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he perfect. was. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. He would clap, 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 clap. And when he stopped clapping, you'd have to stop running. So you're essentially doing sprint intervals in this square and in between each other, filling the space. So if you see a gap, you run into it. You just keep running until he stops clapping. If he stops clapping, you have to stop where you are and just hold a position. And that was like a warm-up, like a warm-up drill we did every day. I mean, you do it for about half an hour. So you do sprint intervals for about half an hour. You'd be drenched. And then he'd be like, right, get you get on his back. And now you have to walk slowly and take two minutes to cross the room. So it was actually, clowning is more what you think mime would right, be. okay, okay. So clowning was very much about um, telling a story through facial expressions and making a fool of yourself. Um, whereas when you, I, I know, I agree. When you think of mime, you think of like the like, ooh, like, tap, like the weird like facial expressions. But clowning is all about building your own mask and like this is your mask, this is your character. Um, so you do loads of crazy stuff in, in clown. It was a lot of fun. We did actually improvise an orgy as well. I told this story to a few friends. We had one practitioner come in and we had one show that was about the book of Revelation. Um, and there was one scene in the play where it's an orgy. And he was like, uh, how old were you? Uh, 20, 19. Okay. I'm sure some parents love this, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure other people haven't explained the story as, as detailed as I'm about to. Okay. Here um, we go. Strap in. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a huge hall. And he left the door ajar so there was a light down the hallway. So you could still see in the room slightly. There was like a beam of light down the middle. He, would, he sat there on a, a desk with a notepad, just like writing what he saw and what worked and what didn't work. Obviously, there's no actual intercourse or anything sexual. We all had to sit in a circle to begin with. And then he went, right, we need a, a, like a code word. If you're uncomfortable at any point, you just say it to the, the person you're improvising with. And then they, they have to stop. So we chose chestnuts. Because that's not a sexy word. You're not going to be like, oh, chestnuts in someone's ear. Um, some people might. Each their own. Yeah. yeah, if someone might see it, you've got an allergy, they might. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Is that raw cheese? Chestnuts aren't oh, actually chestnuts. nuts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have outed yourself. Yeah, I've been that's a fool of my friends. <laughs> was mime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clowning. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, and then for about 45 minutes, we didn't. he didn't tell us how long we we're going for. No music, nothing. Just a dark room. Probably the last time you were in that situation. Yeah, literally. <laughs> and a dark room. And he literally was just like, go. And everyone just started like hu hugging each other, like kissing each other's cheeks, like laying on the floor. It was odd, odd, a weird experience. And then 45 minutes went up, turned the light on and went, right, let's everyone sit back in the circle. And then we just discussed what we found. So like, the, the mechanism, I assume, is making you as physically uncomfortable as possible so that you can reflect on yeah. the carrots he brought to the table. But exactly, yeah. W w was that a big a big gap to bridge for you in that situation and those around you? Did you mm. feel confident going into that no. to just disassociate from the acting? No, but it's it, it those sort of exercises helped me massively. All oh, this sounds weird. It helped me massively drop any inhibitions because now i go into like the real world since doing that and i another story i played a pygmy goat for two hours i have heard this have i told you that before yes i played a pygmy goat for two hours and like i had like neck cramps from from like doing this <laughs> all that like for two hours just like passing out and afterwards i like had a bit of a tick <laughs> for like half the day because i was like i need to stop doing that um but th if you if you play a pygmy goat for two hours you're probably going to be a different person at the end of it 
and I came out of the whole the whole two year course. I came out and was like, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's a sentence that's ever been used in human history before. Yeah, literally, I could sell a course. Yeah, lessons <laughs> lessons learned is uh, number one: you play a pygmy goat for a couple of hours, you're gonna come out the other side a different person. True. Yeah, fact. I know what I'm doing this evening. Yeah, yeah, I'm with me. Um, <laughs> I said we weren't gonna talk about that. <laughs> Anyway, continue. Uh, Please, sorry. But yeah, I came out of drama school a very, very different person, um, which was great. The thing I always find funny about drama, mm -hmm. acting, same with online presence, less so now because it's much more normal and aspirational in, in younger people. But for years, putting a video up on YouTube or saying you're an actor mm -hmm. until you were of a certain level, in a teenage, younger person's environment, you were a gimp. 100%. Or, wow, that person's amazing. There was no in-between. No, no yeah. in-between. Like, yeah. I think back to school and, like, we idolized Brad Pitt. But if somebody said, I'm in the school play, it was like, what are you doing? That's so weird. Yeah, so true. So I don't really, I've never really understood why that is the case. And I think it probably comes from an insecurity in the fact that that person is happy and confident projecting themselves outwardly at an age where there's a lot of uncertainty in who you are and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's That's my logic on it. And I think back now because... I did feel, I've got a friend called Max, if he's listening, I remember, and I apologize for taking the piss out of you for being in that play, but I did. And I'll hold my hand up and say yeah. that I did. And now I look back and I think, wow, Max at that age was confident enough to go on stage and present himself in such a way and enjoy doing it. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. All whilst I was thinking, wow, Brad Pitt was good in Achilles, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and it's, the same, it's the same practice. It's yeah. the same mechanism. So what, what was the what was the difference in my head? And it's, it's similar on YouTube. Like I was reluctant when I started because mm -hmm. I didn't want to, why is he putting up YouTube videos? That's a bit weird. Nobody's, yeah. nobody's going to watch them. What's he doing? Yeah. Was there any of that internal battle for you? Did you have people around you sort of barking down your ear being like, what are you doing, Sam? This is a bit cringe. Mm. You had your mom, obviously, who had the background, which probably gave you a real good foot in the door to burst through that. 100%. But I've had this discussion with other people where I, I kind of reflect on the strangeness that is the yeah. gap between Hollywood and pantomimes yeah, yeah. and why our perception of that in Britain anyway is mm -hmm. very, very different. Did, did you struggle with that? Were there any challenges to your confidence? Was your sense of identity challenged by those around you? Or once were you, you were at drama school, you just felt like you belonged yeah, and that was what you could do? At drama school, I felt like I belonged. Okay. As soon as I was there, I was like, these are the people I want to be spending time with. And for two years, 40 hours a week, it was very much a bubble. It was like an asylum, like nothing else really existed for those two years. And it wasn't until I left drama school the, the realization that I'm doing quite a difficult, I'm following quite or climbing quite a difficult ladder that's missing a few little rungs. What are they call the rungs, rungs are they all rungs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rungs, yeah. nailed it. Um, you should have backed yourself, yeah, just seen it straight through. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> missed a few rungs. Uh, oh, that was clean, <laughs> yeah, clean. Um, so I knew it, that realization again didn't hit until I left drama school, and while I was in drama school practitioners, directors, the head of the school, et cetera, are all like, if you get an agent when you leave, you're pretty much set up, doors will open for themselves. Um, and we all genuinely believe that. Like you leave drama school thinking, right, the next logical step is auditions for like HBO Max series. Is, is I'm going to be John Stark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just assume that's going to that's gonna happen. And it's about six months into being a waiter or working in retail that people then start to go, the clock is ticking and no one is knocking on my door. Um, which is really the stimulus behind me starting my own content uh, was that if the doors aren't going to be knocking, then I'm going to start fucking making as much noise as I can with the facilities I have, which is just an iPhone and a weird brain. Um, and that's where I am now. And I'm just still doing it. And that's not something that's unique to acting. That is, mm. that is the that is the exact same mechanism as what our parents will tell us is why don't you get hand a CV in at the shop mm. so that they can see your CV. Yeah. That doesn't work anymore. But when it did, mm -hmm. you were separating yourself from the crowd and opening the doors for yourself. And what you did was take action forwards. Mm -hmm. And we've spoken about things today already where you have actively spotted a problem or friction point in your life and been able to say, taking this one step forwards will make these changes, which is a very hard thing to do, but you've always been very good at it. Mm. So your sense of identity purpose at that age, when you left drama school mm -hmm. with all the hope, all the will in the world yeah. and found yourself not necessarily getting the jobs that you thought you would, mm -hmm. what was your sense of self, your sense of purpose, your sense of identity like during that? Because at a young age, I think back to when I was that age, you think you know everything, you think you've figured everything out. Oh yeah. And, and you, you don't necessarily 
learn to adapt as quickly as you might do now. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how was, how, how did you feel on a day-to-day -day basis managing that rejection, managing those punches and actually then effectively planning what you were going to do next? Cause that's a hard thing to do actually yeah. saying this is what I'm going to do and then doing it is tough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I've said previously, but like it was training was the safety blanket for me. It's what kind of saved me from this chaos that I was in. Cause I was just with hospitality and the, the nature of the beast. It was a very, very like premium restaurant. So it's, big spending people with signet rings, Rolexes, all these people that are coming and expecting the world. You see people snorting in the toilets. It's like, you're very much around that sort of environment. Um, and I knew I didn't want to be involved in that. Um, so I found training, I found CrossFit and uh, I just started training. And it was the only positive thing in my life that was like, I'm getting a lot of no's in auditions. And the one yes I'm getting every day is from a little old coach that's just telling me that was good, yep. Or more weight on the bar. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can do more, keep going, keep lifting, and then going, maybe don't lift any more. You hit that one clean. That's perfect. I'll see you tomorrow. We've got endurance. Um, well done today. Pat on the shoulder. Um, whereas that you go to an audition room, you turn up to a like an NHS training video that's six hundred pounds, it's two days of filming, and you think you're being unique by wearing a blue shirt, and everyone in the waiting room has got as the same mustache, the same receding hairline, we're all in a blue shirt and you're like, well, oh, fuck me. Everyone looks the same. I'm not getting this gig. Um, so there's this really toxic world of just like, audition rooms are weird because you go in, even the reception staff that are checking the actors in, I think every actor is overly nice. They're overly nice to every single person along the way because they think they might speak to the producer, they might speak to the directors. So Very like, false. Yeah, everyone comes in, they add a voice, they put on a voice, they go, Sam Cornforth for the NHS advert. And then they sit down and everyone's like, some people are like, just like smiling at each other. Like it's all, it's all so false. And everyone starts awkwardly having conversations, being like, um, nice, I don't know. Nice blue shirt. Yeah, they're like, oh, like a shirt. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? We're all the, like, it's just awkward. And no one's being themselves because everyone is shitting it and everyone's desperate for a job. Um, so training was that one thing that I could turn up and I could wear a Primark t-shirt, Primark shorts, some Vans and give it my best effort. And as long as I did that, someone would at the end of the class be like, well done, fist bump, you smashed it. And that for me was like, that became the addiction. Um, and that's what yeah helped me along the way. So early days of that addiction, quote unquote, mm. you got aggressive with trying to integrate yourself into the community that you yeah. wanted to be a part of, didn't you? Yeah. Because I can imagine as well, leaving acting school, you said you felt like you belonged. Mm -hmm. You probably felt like you didn't belong in the current headspace you were in. Yeah, in yeah, them, definitely. In the hospitality trade. And you approached Wit, said, here's my CV. I'd like a job, please. Mm -hmm. In fact, no, give me a job. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. And you ended up getting one and worked in customer service for 18 months. But yeah. the the action and confidence to be able to go and do that amidst all of the challenges and rejections and mm -hmm. falsities of the audition rooms mm -hmm. is, is admirable because it, it does just go to show that one small change on a day-to-day -day basis can have ramifications six, seven, eight years down the line mm, that, are, yeah. that can be life-changing. So I, th I think it's just an important message because I think back to the small things I did that seemed so insignificant years ago that from a mental well-being career general trajectory point of view have completely changed my life mm. life for the better mm -hmm. so the process of getting involved at wit talk us through it because that's been a big part of your life hasn't Huge. it a big part of your life yeah, yeah. it still is a part of your life yeah yeah definitely so i um i was actually uh after hawksmoor which was the restaurant i worked with beautiful restaurant if you ever want a good steak in london please go to hawksmoor not an ad um but the best service you'll ever get the waiters are all amazing um so after the hawksmoor I found a job on LinkedIn. There was a startup in a fitness company. Uh, this wasn't wit. This was a, a outdoor. Um, it was like physical games for adults. So it was like yoga ball, dodgeball right. in parks around London. And they needed someone to do social media. And at the time I was just posting workout videos on myself. I enjoyed the process of posting on social media. And I was like, social media is something I'd like to get involved in. I consume a lot of it anyway. And the job was like 1000 pounds a month in London, which is nothing uh it's awful it's like yeah like slave labor um but i was like i know that i should just do it 
because I, that's I don't want to be a waiter and I don't want to like climb the, the the hospitality ladder. I don't want to be sat in an office at 12 p.m. with a beer, writing a rota or something like that. I, I was like, not what I want to be doing, even though they're well paid. Um, and some people enjoy that, and that is fine. If you enjoy that, then do it. Like if you enjoy being in the like as a restauranteur or in the hospitality space, and people do love it and, and do it. Um, and Hawksmoor was an amazing place to work, but I knew I wanted to be elsewhere, so I applied for this job, had the interview. And I got the job and I was working like 50, 50 hours a week for a thousand pounds a month, not a PT. And I was running on the weekend, uh, adult dodgeball classes for like 20 pounds an hour. And at the Did time, you have the mustache yet? No, 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 nothing. No, oh, I was, uh, there was uh, just in my head. I saw you as Ben Stiller. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You dodge a red, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> yeah. Coming in like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what he says as well when he's, he's staring at the pizza slice there was a there was a conversation we had earlier about when you were peak crossfit early days avoiding carbs oh yeah i, yeah. I can i can just see you in his little dodgeball shoulder pads eyeing up that pizza yeah, getting yeah. all aggressive with it but the, the, the god of those days gone of those yeah, days yeah. Just, the cock pump the, the air thing he puts in his do you need a cock pump yeah, is that what you're trying I, to yeah, say I have okay. a cock pump, yeah. yeah okay okay um but i applied for this job got the job and i was working my ass off uh and there was no one really above me, so I wasn't really learning much. Hmm. As it wasn't like I was working with anyone else in the social media team; it was just me by myself. Um, but I knew I was in—I was in the right, going in the right direction. It's where I wanted to be in the fitness space, working in social media in some capacity. And then it got about six months in, and I was literally—I was so skint. I was like so heavily in an overdraft. I remember literally every morning I'd walk to Waitrose because if you had a Waitrose keep cup, you could go to their machine, yep. buy one banana like the 15p banana and you get a free coffee and i used to do that every day to get a coffee because i was like i can't afford to go get a two pound 30 coffee because i was like i won't be able to eat and i was like just every paycheck was just my overdraft was going boop, ringing lloyd's can i get 500 pounds more yep and just getting deeper and deeper into an overdraft um and then taking my prep cup back to get a filter coffee because then they give you 50p off a 99p filter coffee and sometimes they just go, oh, you, 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 do you want a new cup? And I'm like, oh, no, I want the 50p off. And they go, oh, don't worry about it. It's on the house. Stuff like that. Finding hacks to like save money more than just coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was it just? <laughs> there's, a, there's an ebook coming very soon. Yeah. <laughs> how, to, uh, how to drink coffee and stay wealthy by yeah, Sam Comforth. Exactly. <laughs> but I knew I couldn't do that anymore. It wasn't sustainable and I wasn't learning anymore. So I literally, in my lunch break of this job, walked to, to St. Paul's with my CV printed that I printed in the office, put it on the retail desk and I was like, hey, I'm really into CrossFit. I really like this space. I'm a big fan of WIT. Um, I would love to get a job. And they were like, oh yeah, they received it, took it in. I didn't hear anything for like a month. And I was like, again, chipping further into this overdraft. And I was like, I need an out. I need something that I can like, I want to climb. I want a ladder to climb and this isn't the one I want to be climbing right now. And then I just copy and pasted my whole CV and sent it to both the founders and then just went, uh, I basically just said, you won't regret it. Like, I know you're not going to regret hiring me. Just please give me something. I I'll do like coach. I'll do a level one and just coach. I was like, I'll do literally anything, retail, anything. And then uh, they both got in touch and uh, offered me a very part-time customer service role because the current girl needed to move into buying. Um, Kate, who's lovely, Kate Ford, if you're listening. Um, and she moved into buying and then I was doing 10 a.m. till 2 p.m., four days a week for wit uh for like the same money as i was on so about a grand okay. it wasn't a lot but i was like i've got more free time i've got a free wit membership i'm around people that are like inspiring me i'm seeing like people like elliot simmons jamie simmons training who are their athletes at the time and i was like this is unreal i'm watching i'm like living in the documentaries i love so i was like right i'm in the right place just graft your ass off and then it was like two weeks or three weeks later, they upped my hours because they enjoyed working with me in customer service. And then I was full-time wit. And then fast forward from, that was like 2019, COVID hit. I started making videos in COVID in lockdown in when I had more free time while still doing customer service. And then uh, the marketing department were kind of like, oh, do you want to start doing that for wit? Started trying to do that for wit. It seemed to be working. Like their TikTok started to grow. And then I was running their social media at wit so it went from customer service well, i went, actually went from the towel folder at wit to begin with at reception checking people in for about two weeks to customer service to helping on marketing alongside customer service to then making content for them and then again a little bit of a fast forward 
realized that if I started doing it just for myself, maybe I could sustain a livelihood that's better than Waitrose bananas and free coffee, um, which seemed surreal to me because it was like a two year window felt like a big, fast blur because I was loving every minute of it. I loved every part of it. Um, and I made the decision recently to leave. So about nearly a year now, self-employed. Uh, thanks to you again for all the conversations we had. Repeatedly gut punching you over the Yeah, end. literally like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I enjoyed those conversations though because it was, um, I, I, I wrestled with the same thoughts for a long time. I always felt like I was playing a game with an expiry date, but the security of the game put me into a false sense of security as to how much I could tolerate. Mm -hmm. And essentially the compromise was my happiness yeah. for the sake of not tackling the fear, even though I was confident in the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just just simply getting some skin in the game yeah. was the, was just backing yourself is kind of all it is. Yeah. And you've clearly, like essentially the, my understanding of the conversation we were having was you just have such a pattern of backing yourself mm -hmm. and taking action where the easier thing to do would be to not, and most people would not. Mm -hmm. And every time it sort of led to the outcome that you have desired. Mm. And patterns generally show competence. Mm -hmm. And that's proven because you're a year on and you're, I'd say currently is content with not just the direction you're going in, but in terms of the metrics of success that you'll operate off from an engagement content point yeah, of view, yeah. upwards, mm -hmm. training, you just PB'd your clean and jerk yesterday, not just a clean as I, yeah, because I only watched half the video. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> I said, right. oh, wow, you cleaned 150s today. Can you jerk that too? And he was like, what? <laughs> of course I can. <laughs> and the, the, the pattern is essentially, it, it's there, it's proven. And it means that this time next year, you'll probably be looking back thinking, holy shit. Mm. Why did I ever ask myself those questions? Why yeah. did I ever think that? So your training's in a great place. Your career is in a great place. In in such a unique, you've been the, it, completely the architect of your own career. Like you've mm. essentially created a channel that did not exist before Sam Cornforth. Yeah. And for those listening that might not be that engaged with Sam's content, mm. I, I completely stand by that statement. You are entirely unique in what you do. And every time I see Sam Cornforth post a video, there's a giddiness of... What roller coaster are we going on today? <laughs> What's this like going to be? Thank you. Because it just means there's a real there's a real sense of expectation with mm. where can one's mind go? Yeah, and yours goes as you said, strange, strange place. places, strange place. But I can't remember how I was going to start this. Essentially, it's 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 a case of you've proven to be able to back yourself and take action. And that mm. has led to the outcomes that you now have. But I remember, I remember where I was going with this before I just started grooming your ego. Yeah, I liked politely. it. I did like it. I'm glad there's a table here. So, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> We've discussed essentially the point you are now, you are content with, I think yeah. it's fair to say. Yeah. 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 But the, the journey you've been on to get here has been one of ups and downs and lessons learned in terms of how you interact with your metrics for success, mm -hmm. your own mental health, your perception on training, how you manage your day to day and what's actually yeah. important to you. Yeah. So do you want to just give us a rundown of the past year of what journey you've been on there? Because I think it's yeah. one that people will find very relatable. Yeah. So uh, and to go back to your point about it being like unique, my account, I feel like it, it's because I don't follow the traditional influencer trajectory or the patterns that you see influencers do where they feel like they need to post once a day or a minimum of nine stories a day or do you know what i mean like i i feel like yeah it's, from it's, the it's, beginning it's the, the ebook guidelines yeah you, you must do x y yeah, and Z, exactly yeah. and I, I from the beginning i was like i it was never the intention of being an influencer it was always content first for me um, because you enjoy it because i love it yeah. i bloody love it i love making videos like nothing brings me more joy than like filming a video with someone and I'm so excited to get home and just sit and edit on my phone and just like, I love like, put like, I go, Alexa, play chill, s soft music or whatever. And it just plays like lo-fi music and I'm there like editing away and like giggling while I'm editing and re replaying things. And I love the storytelling nature of it because that's what I've, I did for two years for 40 hours a week. Um, so at the very beginning of making content was in lockdown. I was still working for WIP, still doing customer service, but around that I had a lot more free time. And then when I went back to Devon for the second lockdown was when it kind of really like elevated because I was living with my brother, my mum, um, and my stepdad. 
and I have I've got a big house like in the middle of Devon. Um, I had a lot of space to film silly sketches. I've got my mum's clothes <laughs> I could wear. Of course. I've got a bald stepdad. I've got my brother who likes making videos and likes filming videos. So I was like, this is the perfect studio setup, really. Um, so I just started making gym sketches. And again, it wasn't that I was making two minute 30 IGTV videos. So they weren't like the best form of uh, engaging content because people would argue, oh, maybe you should just do 90 second reels because of the engagement, the, like, the attention span oh, of the I, audience. IGTV stuff should go on YouTube, not on Instagram. Exactly. Yeah, people were telling things. me, oh, well, why don't you put your phone horizontally and put it on YouTube instead of IG? And I was always just like, no, nah, I, I, I'll just keep doing it. I, I, it's, not, it's just for fun at the end of the day. I like making a fool of me and my brother. Um, so me and my brother just started making videos together. He would just like was wonderfully helpful in not coming up with ideas, but he was just, he didn't understand most of it because he doesn't train. So he was just like, I was just like, just look there and look like, imagine someone just like flailing on a barbell and he was just like, just following my direction um, perfectly. He was always so good. Yeah, the, yeah, big, big shout out. He's Harry, yeah, just, Harry, you're a legend. Perfect execution. He's so perfect good, execution. so, so good. Um, and doesn't realize how talented he is. He's very, very funny. His comedic timing is perfect, um, but doesn't give himself enough credit. So Harry... Give yourself credit and keep training. All right, brother. Um, but anyway, I started making sketches with him. The reaction was way bigger than I thought it possibly could be. Because again, like I said to you in the car on the way here, I went from doing carousels of me doing like skipping and cleans in my garden with like the occasional pug walking by um, to then a, a, a carefully edited two minute 30 short film. And people like there was no teaser. I wasn't like telling people I was going to do it. Um, and again, this goes back to backing yourself. I get a lot of people that DM me, especially in the fitness space. They go like, oh, how do you do it? How do you come up with ideas? Like, I just I, I can't quite get the like level of engagement. Or, but the difficulty is, is in the fitness space, in the PT world, it's very much an aesthetic space. And you're trying to convey, you're trying to convey essentially a message that can be translated to a product ultimately, mm. whereas you're essentially tr creating the content for the sake of the content, not, not, yeah, for, not exactly. for the sake of a funnel. Exactly. Yeah. They're doing, yeah, exactly that. They're going, here's a funny video, free trial. Whereas I'm going, here's a funny video. That's it. And people go, oh. Thank you. Come again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Double tap. That was yeah, a, yeah. That, thank you for that. that like, I'm just, I just want to add value to someone's timeline without it having like a hidden message or motive but a lot of these pts as well they care too much about how they look and again a lot of them think i'm a pt so they don't understand that i spent two years improvising orgies pretending to be a fainting pygmy goat and snogging strangers for 40 hours a week for two years like that's it does something to people like i have zero inhibitions and i'm happy to look like a fool and i feel like some PTs aren't happy to do that, but they could. Like, there are videos I see that, like, the concept is genius, the writing is very funny, but the person that's featured in the video cares too much how they look. And if they just drop that guard and own the jokes, people will be like, wow, you're a cover model and you're funny. Like, like how are you do? Like, there how aren't do many do of those. There aren't, no. no. But um, because they don't, they, they they care too much about how they Sound, look. That sounds harsh to cover models. <laughs> yeah, they're all <aren't>, they're <laughs> boring. <laughs> to, to be fair, just to, just, just to flag that. But no, they're like, if, if, if you were on the cover of Men's Health, because you are pretty jacked, I think it's fair to say, <laughs> and quite funny. I think we've established that. Thank then you, then I think it would be, it would be a different offering, which is mm. a great thing because I think it shows the diversity of the fitness industry and the fact that you don't very much fit into it, which means that people immediately assume, oh, he's a PT that's funny. Yeah, they always Rather do. than, oh, he's a comedian that is also really fit and trained. Yeah, I love training. I just love training alongside. But I think there's a managing expectations consideration here because people that might come to your account for the first time will just see Sam Cornforth being hilarious and very good at executing these videos, mm. not realizing there is a significant amount of delayed gratification that's gone into a that. Lot, yeah. And that's, that's honing your trade. That's, that's mm. doing the reps. Yeah, exactly. Quite literally. And it's not to say that you've done a terrible job of telling people how well trained <laughs> as an actor you are, yeah. Sam, you swine, you're being disingenuous, <laughs> but it's more the fact that pe people always look at the end goal of the person yeah. and think, how can I get there tomorrow mm -hmm. rather than the entire process and commitment that's gone the whole way through? Because I mean, you were method acting as a star when you were younger. Uh, yeah. I was not method acting as a star no. when I was younger. I was actively avoiding it and rinsing my mates for doing so. Yeah, exactly. And I feel foolish for doing that. I want to make yeah. that crystal clear. <laughs> and 
now for me to then assume, right, how can I be like Sam? How can I make videos like Sam in the next couple of weeks? It's thousands is, of hours is, is of discre work. It's yeah. discrediting all the yeah, work that you've done. And that's not a, critic a criticism to people, but it's just another reinforcement that, mm. that beneath the surface with everybody online is an awful lot. Mm. Cover models, good example. Yeah. They're not just on the cover because they just look like that and they came out of the womb like that. There's yeah, lots true. of work that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think that should be reassuring for people that do, if they do watch my content and I'm flattered if they do and they go like, I want to do that to know that I, it's not innate. I wasn't born like to be able to do this. Like I did learn how to do it. I, it, during, like I'd be making YouTube videos for 10 years. Like I, before, um, I went to drama school and before I auditioned for this Sherlock role for the chorus role, I got Sherlock cause I'm a bloody legend. Um, I was editing on Sony Vegas pro that I torrent, I torrented just illegally. Is there a video of you somewhere giving yourself a pledge 10 years down the line or something I've seen? No, yeah. So I, I, I thanked my uh, first hundred subscribers on YouTube or something like that, like a decade ago. So me and my brother shared a bedroom, both single beds, either side of the room, had an Xbox in the middle of the room that we used to just play to death. But during the evenings, we'd lip sync together. This is like 10 years ago on YouTube. We'd, and I would edit them on Sony Vegas Pro on YouTube tutorials, Sony Vegas Pro. And I did a video where I shot myself in the head. I had a blood splatter on the wall. And I, I didn't, I wasn't like to go viral or anything. I just wanted to, to try new things and learn things. And I was excited by sound design and building soundscapes for the videos and stuff. And I taught myself Sony Vegas Pro, went to drama school for thousands of hours and then found training. And now it's just, I'm merging all those worlds into one to hopefully build a sustainable career in making people laugh. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of work has gone into it. And I've been so skin for such a long time, um, borrowing money left, right and center. Uh, but I did like a story recently. There's like the first time in my life that I'm not in debt. And that was a long, long process. Um, and I, congratulations. Thank you. I, I can tell yeah. it's, I can tell it's important. Fuck, to it's you. so like it's mental and like, I don't come from money. Like my family, my dad was in football and had money, but he got the, he was, it was a shit scenario that I can't really go into, but he sadly had to lose his job. Um, and he, when they divorced, my mom was like a single mom going to Bristol to like graft for her three kids. And it was obscene and no money. There was like, at the end of the month, there was never any money. And so we, I grew up with no money. And then to finally like see a plus in your account, you're like, like I've got, how, 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 quid to myself. how did that actually feel? Because like there's, there's clear commitment, there's, there's graph, there's all the obvious stuff. Mm. And I commend you and everybody that's sort of done that for themselves, but you took action, not necessarily out of desperation, but when you start to feel friction in your life, you, you, you went through, you didn't go over, mm. you didn't go around, you went through, you found yeah, the solutions, yeah. you, you got in touch with Dan and Sam to give me a job. You won't regret mm -hmm. it. And that paved the next step and the next step and the next step. The whole way through, you've been led by passion first, finance is second. Mm -hmm. So the faith that you had in your future self is admirable, but something that even just sitting here listening to you, I wonder, I'm like, do I have, do I have that faith in myself? Would I have taken those risks? Mm. And I wonder whether that's confidence that comes from acting mm. or whether that might be something that's innate or whether it's just the fact that you love what you do so much that yeah. the, the pressure of that debt mm was irrelevant in the grand scheme because it's just money. Yeah, it was irrelevant. As it's long just... as, as long as I could just about pay rent and continue to do what I was enjoying, I was like, I'll figure it out. I, I, I'll figure it out. I know I'll figure it out. I was like, worst comes to worst. I moved back to Devon. I live with my family for a few months, save a bit of cash and make videos. And I was like, so the, 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 the risk was worth the, 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 the value that you would gain from the potential of the risk was higher than the risk itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I said it's just money there, which sounds in current economic climate sounds a bit insensitive. And I don't mean mm. it like that. It's more like once you can reframe what money means to you and you yeah, can sort of yeah. disassociate the stress as long, as long as you're not embezzling millions and obviously doing it. <laughs> as long as it, as long as it's within your sphere and you have a sort of backup plan, yeah. you, you can you can reframe your appetite for risk, which you have consistently done over time. And I think for, for people that see you now and admire mm. what you do now, that's a brilliant message to see because mm. it's look at the reps that have been in a fitness setting. There is no better analogy than reps yeah, and sets. True. And you have done many, many German volume training for years. For years. It seems. <laughs> to it PB. Seems. For years and years and years to get one PB. Um, was, was that moment seeing plus in your account, was that a real reflective moment for you? Yeah, it's like the only time I've cried in the past like three years was that. 
because I was like, it wasn't even like the money doesn't mean anything to me. Like, I mean, I'm in an amazing situation now where I I know I can pay rent, which is like rent as long as rent's covered. Again, I'm I'm fine. I, the rest of it, I just I like takeaway coffees. <laughs> and what? <laughs> as what? I've <laughs> mentioned many uh, times, uh, the, the, the bananas is just a nice bonus. Yeah, there. the bananas are a bonus, extra carbs. Um, but like as long as I can pay rent and get a takeaway coffee once a day, I feel like I've done enough. I, I don't I don't need a car. I don't need a bike. I, as long as I have those things in my life and I have a phone in my hands to be able to charge and make videos, that's all I need. Um, what was the question? Sorry. The moment. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the beautiful point of my life right now is even when brand deals come in, I say no to more of them than I thought I would. Like I say no to probably 70% of the deals because I, time for me is more valuable than money. Like I'd rather have time to myself to think of ideas, to film with friends and make real, organic, engaging content than a little purse, like a little prize pot from a brand that's potentially not going to speak to me ever again. And that's really clear in your method to this point where integrity within your passion has always come first mm. and finances have come second. Yeah. Which means that it must be much better trained into you that when Boombod offers you a hundred grand for yeah, a TikTok, no chance. Yeah. it doesn't even cross your mind even, because no. passion first, finance is second, which yeah. means you'll never be swayed in the other direction. No. And, and again, because I've come from a very heavily grafting family, like people are always like, Oh, what if it gets to your head? What if it gets to your head? Like my head is massive. Physically, I've got a massive head, but metaphorically, I'm... there's lots of there's lots of space to be filled. <laughs> there's lots of space. There's lots of video ideas out there. The forehead keeps growing, um, but having someone like my mum in my corner who loves what I do and is constantly applauding everything I do and fucking honest. Like if I send her a video and she doesn't like it, she will just go. Damn, it's obviously a better one. But I didn't really understand this bit. Maybe you'd like, and she helps, and Harry helps as well. Direct things, and my sister's always there on on tap to just like call me and chat about stuff. Are you um, are you closer as a family because of what you now do? I think so. I think so because I'm actually the only one that lives away at the minute. So my sister okay. lives in, in quite nearby to my my mum. My brother's gone back to defer for a year uh, for for uni. Um, so I'm kind of the only one that's flown the nest. Um, and yeah, they're so fucking supportive. It's so so good. Um, and it's the first time in my life that I've been able to help support my family. So like I, when I, my brother's in my videos, I pay him. It's not like I, I like if my sister's in my videos, I pay her. If she holds my camera for half a video. I'm going to pay her because I know that like how much that would have meant to me when I was grafting and feeling like I was like, I don't know, banging my head against the wall to, to afford a coffee. Uh, I would have loved someone to go, do you want to film a silly sketch? And I'll give you a hundred quid. Like that would, I'd be like, yes. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. Um, so whenever we film as a family, I'm always like, of course, like if I do an advert with my family, I'm not going to keep whatever the money is to myself. I split it amongst all of us. Um, cause I want us all to win. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an analogy or a metaphor about the tides and something, one big wave lifts all the boats or something. <laughs> Google it. You're lazy. <laughs> One big wave <laughs> lifts it? all the boats. High tides. I think factually, high factually tides. that sounds correct. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Is it to do with friendship? No. There's tall sounds... ships and small ships. That that classic one, that bloody on. best man speak. I think it's there's tall ships and small ships, but the best ships are friendships. Or something. Oh, it's something like, nice. I, I'm missing the middle yeah, part. Yeah, it's not the one. But <laughs> no. High tides lift all boats, something. You know what I mean? I, I want us all to win, basically. Um, and. Yeah. I will Google that later for yeah, my, for my own it. satisfaction, but everybody yeah, listening so will, will be doing the same. Well. <laughs> but don't do it if you're driving in a car. <laughs> yeah, please. As I look aggressively at the camera, and I very much hope that nobody is looking <laughs> yeah. at me in the eye right now driving a car. Yeah. <laughs> unless you're a passenger, in which case I'll, I'll allow it. So <laughs> you, you seem very content. There's a lot of work that's gone into getting to this position. It might, it, it might be easy to get complacent at this point, but that doesn't really seem in your DNA. But the flip side is you, you have control over your time. You have control over all of the things that are important to you, which is having a roof over your head and getting to spend time doing the things you enjoy doing. So what, what, are, your, what are your growth plans? What are the bigger mm. picture goals? What does Sam Cornforth at his peak look like in your head? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, a very, it's one I'm constantly battling with in my head because 
there's the traditional kind of social media influencer route of going into like presenting or something like that. And I, I don't know if I want to, I would, I don't know if I would want to be a presenter. I love performing live. I love everything about it. I love being in shows. Um, the only reason I haven't done it until now is because financially I couldn't afford to do it. That's why you don't see a lot of working class actors blowing up on stage is because they simply can't sustain that low wage for such a long period to ever get noticed. That's why you see a lot of white upper class men make it, not to name names, but people like you mentioned him before, Benedict Cumberbatch. He's come from money. Tom Hiddleston come from money. And the reason they're Loki and Doctor Strange and all these people is because they could afford to have a platform for a very long time where they're not being paid very much because they've got a lot in their accounts already. There's also a real culture of Hollywood families generating Hollywood kids as well, isn't 100%. there? 100%, yeah, yeah. Why, why, is it just because they've got the access? Doors are unlocked already. Doors yeah. are unlocked already. Or, again, they can perform in Hollywood in very low-paid jobs that have yeah. potentially big audiences for a very, very long time until the right person sits in that crowd. And their smaller CV can be leveraged by their, exactly, their yeah. agent that they got through their yeah. connections. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, you, you were saying about the, 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 the future. The future. So I do love stage. I love performing on stage. Um, I would love to do a one-man show at some point. And I've got a silly idea that I would love to get my whole family involved, but it's still a one-man show. But they'd all be in morph suits. And... They're like green screen people. See, this is what I mean when I pick up the phone and see Sam Cornforth has uploaded a video because <laughs> where the fuck is this going? So that's why I do it. I, I, I spoke to my brother about it the other day and I was like, I really want to get like morph suits for everyone. And they're like the the umpa lumpers of the show. And I'm Willy Wonka doing the show, like almost like a from the beginning to now of my autobiography, my life. And uh, my family do voiceovers on stage, but they're also like the transition people. And it's like the, the jokes are very much in their transitions and then being on stage. Um, so I'd love to do a one man show with my family involved in some capacity. Uh, but then I'd also actually just like the opportunity to act on TV. Like, I feel like it's always a surprise to people when you see comedic people performing, like actually acting in quite raw hard hitting pieces it's like Ke kevin hart yeah like you actually watch him act now and people want him to be terrible yeah he, 100%. he, he isn't terrible yeah yeah like yeah everybody everybody on facebook threads kevin from blazing stoke with his bmp registration number in his facebook bio yeah yeah booking shit actor edl frame yeah <laughs> we were laughing about this earlier weren't we <laughs> yeah. um Facebook threads are chaos, but essentially yeah. pe pe every, every thread will always be shit actor. Oh, it'd be good if he could act. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. But there seems to be, do you think it's, do you think it's a bit of a business that people can be both? A do little you, bit. Yeah. Or do you think it's just the fact that people, once they see somebody as something that's funny, it's difficult to perceive them in a light that's, that's serious because this, mm -hmm. this is where people like Daniel Radcliffe, mm -hmm. people like trying to think of big examples where they've done one role that's been them mm. it's very difficult for the public like david to, tennant or someone yeah, like that. yeah it's like, very difficult for the public to perceive yeah, the them as anything casting. else which almost undermines their actual acting ability because the mm -hmm. public perception of their ability is foggy as a result of their previous good acting yeah, execution so true. yeah but like someone like david tennant is an example he's always doing shows with the rsc the royal Sh royal shakespeare company and He's unbelievable. He's so good. He, like his attention to detail, his the way he plays with scripts is unbelievable, but you would never think it because you don't see it unless you go pay to see those theater shows. They're not doing reels. They're not doing TikToks of that show. You have to just be there to experience it. And that feeling of being in the moment with an audience that no one else can ever experience is such a good feeling. Um, so the dream is theater. Big theater would be awesome. Um, but TV, giving it, giving TV a shot would be awesome as well. Stand up. Yeah, stand up is a difficult one. Stand up. I've spoke to a few actual, very successful comedians about this, and um, all of them have told me um, there's a timer on when I need to get going because I need to get going on soon. They say because you, you were saying to me it's because essentially if you become it's, it's the Kevin Hart effect. It's essentially, isn't it? if people if yeah. people register you as one thing and then you try and do another, then they won't register that. Yeah, like if I keep doing gym videos and my following keeps growing, and I go on stage and talk about my family and rather than 
someone missing a snatch or something, they'd be like, where, where are the gym, when are, when are the CrossFit gags coming? It could be a crowd full of people wearing grips <laughs> and smelling salts and like water with lemon in it. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm quite like a Peter K crowd where you just like chat to people as a human and they just like, the observational comedy is there. And um, But I feel like if I did a stand-up show with my background in tech and sound design and um, English language and editing, etc., I would like to do a, maybe a mime show, like you mentioned, like I would like no spoken word, just uh, reacting to voiceovers, reacting to props, et cetera, um, and building stories on stage because we did puppeteering at school and stuff. And there's so much you can do in, in, in storytelling without actually saying anything. And that again, could be a global thing. I could go to a village in Africa and perform with a speaker and they would understand the story. Uh, and that's very like, there's a guy, a practitioner called Peter Brook. There's a book called The Empty Space. And he talks about that, how all an actor needs to tell a story is an audience member and a space. That's all you need. And it can be global, globally understood. Um, and I really resonate with that. I like it. That's, which is why I do quite a lot of non-spoken sketches. I feel like they are harder sometimes. Pressure. Well, I get the sense that you don't actually experience pressure from external factors as I think most people listening and myself included would expect, mm. but you rather internalize that and place it on yourself. Is is that fair? Yeah. That's because the thought fair. of me, I mean, you, you saying you'd rather, I mean, doing stand up is terrifying, mm. but for you to say you actually think you would rather do a one man show with morph suits or even a mime without words so it can be globally applicable is so far beyond that in terms of, Oh my goodness, how on earth can I cope with the pressure of all these people, people in the room? Mm -hmm. That's leagues beyond. Mm. But to you, that seems very natural. Whereas yeah. I know that the pressure that you put on yourself with metrics and the bit of a hole you found yourself in previously, where you yeah. were really, you, you were essentially ascribing your self worth based on the algorithm of social media platforms. 100%. Talk, talk us through the pressure that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis and how it's changed in the sort of past 12 months. Yeah, so you asked me this earlier on as well. You're like, do you have a content strategy? And the honest answer is no. I press post and then it's a blank canvas. I start again and I go, right, what's next? And I feel so lucky if I have two videos in the locker. I feel like I speak to a lot of creators, uh, like Paul Olima, worked with him, lovely bloke. He said to me, he was like, I get stressed if I don't have like a week and a half of content ready to go at any point. So he could go on holiday and then just have seven days of posts while he's abroad, already ready to go, just press post. They're all drafts. I'm never in that position because I like to wait out ideas and I'd rather wait until a good idea comes to me than try and force them. Um, but when you do have those limbo periods where there's like two weeks of like dryness and you're listening to these like, mental health podcasts or these like self-improvement podcasts that they're all like oh the best creative times are when you go on a walk and then i'm literally like going on a walk with no music trying to think of an idea um and it doesn't work and then you're like nothing works <laughs> or like the best idea is coming to you in a shower and i have like a 300 pound energy bill for like two days because i'm just like burning my skin in the shower trying to think of a video um so i do there are those are the most pressure inducing moments are when you feel like you haven't got ideas but I just keep, keep, try to keep reminding myself that I've been in this position before and it worked out. Uh, I, I had an idea and the video went well. Um, but there was a murky period, especially summer last year, where, uh, again, off the back of getting this engagement that I didn't expect to get, were these like fluctuations of these dopamine hits that I did get, I honestly did get addicted to. I did get like, I was like, on a come down the day after posting when I would get like a thousand likes at like 3000 followers. I was like, Oh my God. Like it was unbelievable. And people DMing me be like, bro, your engagement's massive. I go to the gym. People were like, mate, your engagement's crazy. It's so crazy. So then I felt like I was this engagement guy. I was like, I had to keep this engagement. How do I, and then it got to my head so much that I was no longer thinking of the, the concept of videos or the punchlines of jokes or how my performance felt in the moment or how it looked on videos. And I was only thinking of that applause, that double tap from someone's finger that I probably will never meet. 
Um, and then, yeah, it got very rough where it was just uh, the vanity metrics were all that I cared about, um, which was end gaming every single video, which was not why I began. Uh, and it's only really until recently where I, I put on some weight and uh, no one mentioned it. No one said, like, you're looking chubby or anything. I, I like objectively wasn't chubby. I was just fluffier than I was comfortable being. Um, and I didn't like myself. I didn't like how I looked in the mirror um, and uh, my videos. And then my videos just started like I, I was I, what I was telling myself is if I let my body image slide, I have more time to focus on videos. So if I stop training a little bit, if I pump the brakes on training, it gives me two more days of thinking of ideas and bringing videos to life. Um, when in reality, it was totally counterintuitive. I was missing sessions, which played with my mind. And then I was in my own head thinking, oh God, I feel a bit, feel a bit like flubby. And when I think of an idea and then I put pressure on myself thinking, right, well, I allocated myself this time. So I have to think of an idea in this time. And then I would think of rubbish ideas and sometimes the videos wouldn't do very well. And I'd spend like until 12 PM with my ex-girlfriend in wit, waiting for the cleaner to leave 12 AM, sorry, midnight. Um, filming sketches with multiple costumes and they get like 600 likes. And because I was so used to getting a thousand likes on videos that felt like it was just for fun, um, I was starting to worry that I was, I was losing it. Um, and then in recent times, I've just gone, right, I'm unhappy with how I look. Let's focus on training. And then hopefully the rest sorts itself out. And hopefully my followers that are engaged with me understand that this break is for my mental head headspace as well as my physical. Um, what was the comeback video? Uh, there wasn't one individual comeback video. Um, but like I did two videos on holiday and they both went viral. And I was like, and that was me relaxing. I wasn't even stressing. I was just, again, with my family, having fun. And I was like, I need to, I need to constantly remind myself when I do feel that pressure. And there, I get voice notes all the time from people that are around the same following level that go, um, I constantly feel burnt out. I constantly feel this. But the difficulty with them and the, the mistake that they're making and the, the mistake that I always remind them is it's because they're following the traditional influencer trajectory and content plan of I've got cellulite, my mental health, here's a black and white photo, um, here's a snatch tutorial that I've done before, but I'm going to do it with a microphone on my neck in a busy gym because everyone else is doing that. They're doing videos they feel they should be doing because they're seeing a lot of, but it couldn't be further from the truth. They just need to stick to what they're doing and they don't have to renounce if they're taking two weeks off. They don't have to do a post saying, I'll see you in two weeks. I'm dealing with some mental health issues. Just take those two weeks yourself, come back and see how you feel. It might be a month. You might literally need, like you said, with your training, you have to take basically four months off before you felt it's like all, it's almost six, like genuinely yeah, almost six, six, months. almost six months for me to really feel like I'm getting my mojo back. Yeah. And the, 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 the frustration loop I found myself in there is that training is what I do. Mm. Training is a part of everything. Mm -hmm. Training is what allows me to create content. If I'm not training effectively, I don't have my abilities as an athlete, mm -hmm. then there's nothing really interesting for me to talk about. Yeah. And then I sort of pull myself into more desk work. Yeah. And I'm very, always have been very driven, very always on. I enjoy working. I enjoy being head down mm -hmm. at the expense of other things. I've, I've sacrificed a lot of things for a lot of years for mm. the charity projects finance i mean charity projects I've, I've had comments over the years that have irked me because i've had people be like oh it'd be cool if you could donate some of your own money it cost me fourteen and a half thousand pounds to raise 100 grand personally okay. back when i was earning 32 grand a year yeah for example and that was because it was, like you said it was passion driven mm. but then i got to a point where i couldn't see a way forwards from project vertical that would not really damage my own mental health mm -hmm. and that's where things have become that's where things have become more focused on the athletic side of things with the separation with the podcast like this and the public speaking and all the stuff I do separately. Having that boundary has made it much easier for me to process and know what's good for me and what's bad for me. Mm -hmm. But with content, I don't plan things much because I actually don't enjoy the process of creating content that's created for the sake of good content, unless it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a... like. You get to share a narrative. You get to give people information. You get to give yeah. them a story. You get to show them places. You get to do things on YouTube. I enjoy that. And yeah. Ed, who's sitting in the room, helps plan them out. And mm -hmm. we enjoy the process of doing that. But we both find ourselves some days turning up to shoot something. We've just got so much other stuff going on. It's like, oh, fuck. 
yeah I don't want to do this yeah. and then I, i've had to essentially mentally deprioritize any sort of creative well not creative but any sort of real strategic thought about instagram other than what do i want to talk about post that and mm. any growth that comes great exactly but that's trying i think that's super transparent when we well, as a co consumer of your content when i see that i think consumers especially on social media have got much more savvy in their understanding of influencers and content creators especially during covid like everyone's on their phone all day every day everyone during covid was doing workout videos in their garden post that and now everyone's like i think everyone can read between the lines a lot clearer than they used to and i feel it's so obvious when someone's doing something for likes or doing something because they enjoy doing it um and a lot of these influencers try trends or try these lip syncs or copy a style of someone else's video because they got likes and it's just super transparent it's not because they enjoy doing it and they're not having fun they're doing it because they saw another account with a similar demographic get a lot of engagement um but as a consumer of loads of social media we can see that and we know what you're doing so just stick with what you're passionate with and hopefully the rest does itself like works itself out and that's passionately what i need to keep reminding myself is a lot of the time when I try and be clever or try and be engaging, they don't do as well. But if I just focus on the story and just focus on the jokes that make me laugh, my mum laugh, my brother and sister laugh, they're normally the ones that bang, <laughs> uh, which is reassuring to know that uh, my impulse is in the right place. And I just constantly, whenever I feel stressed about not coming up with an idea, I just go, don't go on TikTok and copy someone else's video. Just take a breather. That's going to be more beneficial in the long run than doing something you're unhappy with. It stops you from being a slave to yourself effectively as well. Yeah. Because if you live your life through these binary, arguably arbitrary metrics and frameworks that you need to work with them, because if you're not having a story frame that you can tap mm. through at bloody oh rapid, God, rapid, know, rapid yeah. pace, not getting to the end of them, you're not putting up enough, you're not being authentic about all the highs yeah, and lows exactly. and all this stuff. And I, yeah, I, I really, whenever I even think about doing anything for the sake of, like, I, I don't, I don't even know when the last time I went out and like really putting a lot of effort into anything trend focused. I don't think is anything I've ever really mm -hmm. even conceived of because when I yeah. start thinking about it, I'm like, oh, I don't like that. Yeah. And then I can't, I, I've always been the same at school. I was the same. I could not simply could not engage with subjects that I didn't like or see the point in yeah whereas if i saw a point in the subject i you, you catch me in my room until 10 p.m working away on it and enjoying the process and i've mm. always been like that mm. i think it gives me more control over knowing what's good for me and what's bad for me and actually sticking within those parameters and clearly you've mm. gone through a similar revolution but the pressure that you put on yourself mm. is more based on external metrics than it is for me because essentially I, I hold myself to certain performance standards yeah. and then I get to get creative with how I bring those to life. Mm -hmm. And it's all, there's, there's no, I'm not elite at anything. It's just a case of I get to get a bit creative with how I put certain components of things together in a creative way with ultimately the goal of encouraging more people to try new things and mm -hmm. have more faith. Oh, I can get faster and still be strong. Yeah. Because I spent so many years being strong and not wanting, well, wanting to get faster, but refusing to do the work because I was worried that I would get weaker. Yeah, yeah, and my, so true. my identity would then unravel because I was the strong guy. Yeah. So when you get a brand brief through, through mm -hmm. and you get whirring, you get thinking, mm -hmm. are you thinking about the people at the other end that are going to be watching it and how you can please them? Mm. Or are you thinking about what is going to give me the most enjoyment in creating this? Yeah, that the the latter. Yeah. Um, I within drama school, one of the like one of the beautiful things that they taught you is to within this theatre company, our our saying as a as a group as a collective was um, make each other look good and like fail, and if you fail, fail fucking gloriously, like fail hard because that's way more impressive than just failing a little bit. Um, so we had a, uh, exercise that was yes, let's, so you get into little collective groups within the big wide theater company and separate you into like five or six. And then they would go, right. So we've got 10 minutes. You're going to come up with a, a simple story about injustice. You're going to come up with a simple story about money. You're going to come up with a simple story about sport. And then you'd have a selection of props and they'd say the blockers are 
you have to use all the props and one person has to be holding this prop above the head at all times. Um, but you have to use the props to tell the story. So it could be like a sheet or a veil or like a piece of rope. Um, so for a long time, indirectly, I've been practicing these like these blockers in devising content uh, inadvertently within a theater company. So when a company like uh, Guinness approached me, which I'm very excited about. Um, Do you drink much Guinness? I Sam? love Guinness. And this is an advert. <laughs> this isn't paid. Um, but I do love Guinness. And so when they approached me, I was... <laughs> plenty of evidence of Over well. the moon. Yeah, yeah. We don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> but over the moon when they approached me. And again, there are other brands that approach me as well. And they're not blockers in a negative sense, but they give you requirements. And those requirements are just tools that I then use to make ideas. And I always find having um, a stimulus or something that, uh, that helps you come up with an idea. I use a lot of music to like shot list my, my videos. Um, or a prop, for example, if Guinness provide me with a prop, then I'm, I'm literally just write that prop on a piece of paper, mind map it and just go, what's funny, what's funny, blah, blah, blah. What would make me laugh? Um, and I essentially just use a product to make myself laugh, <laughs> uh, and hopefully make my audience laugh. Um, and so I, again, I'm very picky with who I work with and I can tell very early doors within the first, like first or second call with the company whether it's a creative process I want to be involved with. Um, and again, I won't even answer the, I will answer the emails, but I'll be very like, straight to the point if it's a product that I don't use. Um, because I feel again, there is this like limbo period as an influencer where you feel like you're about to break into influencer territory where you might be in the blue check waters with other influencers where you say yes to every deal very early doors. You might get like 4,000 followers or 6,000 followers, or you hit 10,000 followers and you feel like a celebrity. Like I even felt like that a little bit. I hit 10K and I was like, oh my God, I get a swipe up. I can, I can sell things. And then a month later, Instagram just started <laughs> giving it to everyone. Let's make it I a sticker. So hard. <laughs> and then we we'll just make it a sticker and give it to everyone. <laughs> Cheers, Mark, you prick. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I... Uh, I think there's a lot of people that are very micro, micro influencers. But as soon as they get an email saying like, oh, can you um, put this tea bag on your grid for 35 pounds? They're like, yes, because I want a paid promotion on my grid and I want people to think I'm getting paid for social media. Whereas for a year, I was saying no to everything because I was like, I don't want to look like an influencer. I don't want to look like an influencer. Didn't have management. Some people were offering me like, 500 quid for two stories. And even then I was like, I was too precious over my stories because I was only doing BTS. For a long period of time, I was only doing behind the scenes when I posted. So otherwise I would be silent. I'd be silent on my grid, silent on stories. Because um, then I wanted, if you see my face with a ring, you know it's time. It's like the recording light is on. He's on. Like, let's go watch his new video. So I wanted that. Um, so for ages I said no, but I think a lot of influencers just say yes to everything. And then they just, they shoot themselves in the foot because then they're following is no longer interested in their content because they go, it's another ad. It's another ad. It's another ad. It's another ad. Um, so I'm very careful with these paid promotions and who I select and who I say yes to. Um, and again, the fee for some of them, some of them I say yes to them because I, I think it's a cool opportunity and the fee's not great, but I'm like, it's a brand that I genuinely consume and I would like love to help them and they've been lovely in the process and I'll say yes to them and I'll, I'll do a video for them and hopefully in the long run we can do bigger, better things together. But um, the devising process, if I have an item or a sound or a theme to work on, it helps so much uh, with this yes, let's mentality where you just try things, write things down, share it amongst your your peers. And if people go like, oh, maybe you should try this, but try this. Um, and that's something I'm trying to work on is having a group of people that I, uh, like you have with each other, you have like a creative, you must have a creative chats constantly. Oh, yeah. Pretty much all we do. Yeah, exactly. It's a constant loop of shit. We need to change this. How do we do yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, no. Uh, okay, see you uh, Monday. Yeah, yeah, but for a long period of time, it was just me sending finished products to my family Facebook, and I knew however they reacted is how well the video would do. Um, and normally it was pretty accurate. Like if they were very, very, if they enjoyed it, I was like, oh, relieved. It'll do well tomorrow on Instagram. Um, but I think I need something more professional than that, and I, I feel sorry for my family when they're 
the whole family chat is taken up by their directing like directing notes <laughs> my mom like i didn't like this sound the fart didn't sound real <laughs> here's one for you yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> i've recorded it on uh, quick time so it should sound crystal clear yeah. what has been the favorite video to create oof question one what has been the favorite video to bask in the glory of question two uh, favorite video to create was definitely the never let them guess your next yeah, move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I got the whole family involved. It, we basically rehearsed it like a theater piece. So if you haven't seen it, it's a trend that's um, essentially you never let the audience guess your next move. You do something completely unpredictable so they keep watching. And then that retention of them watching their eyeballs on the screen just boosts it through the fucking ceiling and everyone watches it and it goes hugely viral, you would think. And it did work. Um, but I had about a three hour period. It was like a random Sunday. It was like Easter last year. It was actually like a year, two days ago or three days ago that we filmed it. Um, about a two and a half hour rehearsal with props of me walking through, directing my sister who's filming because she's just as much involved as anyone else that's in the video. My mum's sat in a dog house in the garden for with two hours on. with a blue wig on, holding a poo bag. And my stepdad um, is like, we're practicing egg splats on his head like all day. Um, and then we did two to two total takes because my mum didn't want to smash loads of her mugs. And in one of the moments, I smash a mug. So she was like going through the kitchen, trying to find mugs she doesn't like. She was like, we're like cracking them a little bit in the sink. So when I drop it, it definitely cracks. We had so many takes of me just going, and it just bounces and doesn't crack. We have to go back to the beginning. Oh, crack, dear. find another egg, crack it on the floor. Um, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and I like enjoying videos with other people and when they're involved. That's why I do a lot of collabs with athletes is because... I, I know they're not going to do it themselves and I love doing it with them and then putting their trust in me is such a compliment and then for it to pay off is always wonderful. Like I did a video with Elliot and Jamie who um, don't really like doing social media, but they're very good looking. They're very funny and they just don't show it on social because they're, they're athletes at the end of the day. That's their, their priority. Clearly not mine, but that is their priority. Um, so I was like, I've got a shot list. Let me come to Cardiff. I'll film with you. Filmed with them. And it, it blew up. It did so, so well. And to hear then in WhatsApp groups be like, oh, I love this. It's, it's so funny that uh, the comment, have you seen this comment? Have you seen this comment? That otherwise wouldn't be on their phone, but they're like enjoying it with me. It's such a nice feeling. So it was lovely to see my mum uh, and my brother and my stepdad and everyone loving the glory. We shared the glory together that it went well and all that rehearsing uh, was worth it. Um, but again, I said this to you as well. I need to be, my mum uh, is a bit of a nightmare on social media. Um, her name is Pug and Doug uh, on Instagram, all right? So if you ever see that in my comment section, it's an aggressive comment. It's my mum. It's not me. I don't have a second account. Uh, but if I ever get a little nudge on my Garmin saying, Pug and Doug has commented on your post, I shit myself because I know my mum is arguing with someone in my comment section. <laughs> and it's an absolute nightmare. And I've threatened to block her so many times. We've had so many arguments. I just knock on her bedroom and she's sat there with a vape in her mouth her iPad like this in a dressing gown looking over her glasses. And I'm like, are you arguing again with Sally Seven? <laughs> and User like, nine Yeah, seven literally, four. with no yeah. profile picture. Um, so if you do see Pug and Dog in my comments, just do you know that's not my fake account because all the posts are me and dogs. Uh, Very unconventional Easter Sunday, that video, I can yeah, imagine. Yeah, entirely. Uh, again, you, you, we've, we've uttered some sentences I'm not sure I've ever been uttered before today. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty confident that's an Easter Sunday that no other family in the world yeah. has experienced together. So that was question number one. Yeah. Question number two, what have you enjoyed basking in the glory of most? Uh, the Punch's Beard Off Christmas Kid. Uh, because that was, that took a long time. Uh <laughs> It took a long, long time oh, to dear. rehearse that by myself in a school uniform um, with a mustache. <laughs> with, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that one for sure, because um, I filmed it two years ago. I filmed it two years ago and I rehearsed it for like two days. I had it on my AirPods. I went for a run listening to it on loop on like a 10K jog in Devon because I wanted to like just not even pay attention to it, just have the noises going in and out, in and in. Just subliminal. Yeah, just like yeah. constant noise in my head, this drone of this, um, oh, you're not going to get Christmas because you're being a naughty boy and all this. And then the kid just being hilarious. Jackson, his dad follows me. He's a legend. 
Uh, and thank you for approving the, the video because that would have been a nightmare if I made the video. And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, literally. I'd have had to post it on what's it called? The let's run.com or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rumble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally. Um, but I posted it two years ago and I put money behind it on TikTok. I put 30 pounds, three pounds a day for 10 days because I was like, I want this to go so viral because I've worked so hard to make it work. And I, I was like, I think I've nailed it. And I was like, I think I've nailed it. Let's pray it goes viral. I'll pay 30 pounds myself to boost it initially. And then hopefully all those people just share it. And it did nothing. It went nowhere. And I was so annoyed. I tagged Lad Bible, Uni Lad. I tagged every po- memes are uh, nugget. I tagged to all these accounts that I could think of that potentially might see it and go like, hey, can you, if you send it to us, we'll repost it. And I might get like a bump of followers nothing didn't get anything and then it wasn't until uh the december just gone i believe yeah just before christmas i um i just decided i went normally i wouldn't repost content because I, I i i'm still undecided how i feel about reposting content um i went you know what it's christmas it's a week before christmas if there's any time to repost it, it's now. I'm just going to repost it on TikTok and Instagram and just ignore it and just say like this time last year on Instagram and then just put a generic caption on TikTok. And then it blew up. And then I didn't tag Uni Lad or Lad Bible or anyone, but they all came knocking. You all came knocking, didn't you? You bastards. Uh, and I did give it to you, to be fair. <laughs> I did say you could have it. Uh, but they haven't paid me, Lad Bible. You haven't paid me. You said you pay people. You haven't paid me. Um, oh. Yeah, drama. drama. Yeah, they haven't paid me. That doesn't surprise me even slightly. No, yeah, we'll give you 150 quid if you say yes. I yeah, said yes, like a, uh, no money. Or what's, the, what's the old... Uh, you've the, been framed. The, yes, you've been yeah. framed. Was it 300 quid? 250 quid? 250 yeah, quid. Yeah. All these fa- poor families People all over the UK. falling off treadmills like, and right, stuff. Right, Sally, if you fall off Sun Lounger and land in pool on holiday, then we'll get 250 Yeah, we'll go to the harvester. And then <laughs> fucking Sally ends up splitting her head open and Steve, whose idea it was, yeah. ends up going to hospital with a thousand pound bill. In on 24 the... hours in A&E for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good crossover. Yeah. I wasn't going that direction, but we have a daytime TV collab. There, there go. we go. But so, that was definitely when that one popped off for free. <laughs> a year later, I was so happy. So, so happy. Um, and it did very well. And still, I go on nights out now in southwest london and i had one woman recently i was like with my mate in the smoking area vaping don't do it anymore but i was smoking an elf bar and a woman on the window just bang 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 and i was shit myself and looked over and she went and i was like what am i about to get I was, battered? I was like, Fuck it. I was looking around and she was like I literally didn't know what was happening. And I was like, for anyone listening, oh Sam is punching the air and whispering. Air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so I went back in and I was like, is she going to like start on me in here? And I went in and she went, punch his beard off. And I was like, oh God. And it was her birthday in the, in the end. And um, yeah, you all boogied. But, you had um, requests to be on Cameo. Yes. Yeah, I had Cameo for a while. I did pause it because I was, uh, I spent too long doing videos. Like a lot of people on Cameo, like we were speaking about Jay from in between us. He does one take like, all right, Shaggers, uh, Jay here. Um, he just tra- does quotes, the same quote in every single one of them. But he does one take and he's got his gaming headset on or he's in the back of a taxi. I put my tripod down. I get a selfie light out. I write notes on their birthday date, the song that was in the charts on their birthday. I, d- I dance, to- I do an improvised dance to their birthday song. I mean, it's too much. I spent like... This doesn't sound like Cameo, Sam. <laughs> is this the beginning? Of, is this the beginning of Sam Pornforth? Yeah, yeah. No, it should be. If anyone's interested, let me know. But um, yeah, I spent like forty-five minutes doing a fifteen-pound video. Did, did, did people ask for this? Did people ask for birthday synced no, songs? No, they would just be like, "Love your well, videos." Why Can did you... that become your gold standard? Well, I set the standard too early. I, I really wanted to smash it out of the park to begin with. And then, annoyingly, you can see all the previous cameos on someone's account, so you can scroll through. So I set the standard too high, and then when people were like, "Oh, and he, this song was his number one, by the way," and they'd let me know, and I'd be like, "Fuck, I need like forty-five minutes." I, so if I had like four in a row, I'd do like two and a half hours of recording in one night for fifty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were a cami ho. Yeah, I was. Oh, good. Thank you, thank yeah. you, everyone. Uh, that's yeah, that was silly. Really that, silly. that probably could have been quite entertaining for you to do silly little Jay from the in between a sort of video, yeah I should I rather should. than if, improvised yeah, there's, yeah. there's a comedian in you that cannot be caged isn't there no I know I know if I do unpause my account it will I'm sorry be single takes from now on but, um, 
At the same price. At the, more, more expensive. I've got a blue tick now. This is what uh, that Emma Chamberlain woman did, didn't she? She was charging $10,000 for a DM response. Was she? I think essentially a PR company just put it there as a way of people being like, please stop DMing her. Oh, really? So it was like a deterrent, but now it, it was just too high a number and people have been like, what is this? Yeah, so now it's silly. caused a PR shitstorm. So it's, oh, really? it seems that you, you've done, a, you've you've taken a sensible approach to managing your relationship with something, yeah. rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to charge ten grand for my cameos, and I might up the ante a little bit. Yeah, people do. People really do. So final question, because if people want to listen to more about your feats as a silent killer of a CrossFit athlete, yeah. they can listen to the Omnia Performance Podcast, yeah. where we discuss things in more detail. But you clearly have a vision for yourself for the future in terms of what your goals are as an individual from a career point of view, but underpinning all that as a pillar of your mental health and your well-being is training, mm -hmm. and you're good at it, very good at it. So goals as an athlete, how do you see the next couple of years going for you? What's important to you? What lessons have you learned? And are there any bucket list things you want to take off? Good question. Uh, so my... I don't really set New Year's resolutions, but at the beginning of the year, when I was training at a CrossFit gym, they had the question of the day uh, when you were checking in was um, goal for December. Like, what would you want to feel in December this year? Like, what's the end goal? Uh, and mine was simply, when I'm naked, look like I train. Because at the time, I didn't. And I just want to look like I exercise. Because at like six, seven months ago, I was very fit. Very, very strong, stronger than I am now, but um, didn't look like I moved off the sofa or I just looked like I played PlayStation all day. Uh, so that's my goal is uh, look like I train when I've got my kegs off. Um, but from, from like a physical standpoint, from like a challenge standpoint, it's TBC. Mm. Yeah, like I'm, you're an inspiring bloke. And the more I think of Omnia, the more I look at your accounts and things, I'm like, and I've started seeing this lovely lady who's uh, in athletics, who's helped me with like running, helped me with intervals, understanding pacing and things like that, and doing random sessions like hurdles, shot put, javelins coming soon. I'm going to fucking send it. I know I'm going to maybe a break a record. I, I, I thought that once and then actually tried to throw a javelin and I have never been so existentially disappointed. In oh, myself. really? Yeah, so she let, did say that. But let, I don't me, think I... let me know how it goes. Okay, I'll, let you yeah, yeah, I'll send you a video because it'll make me feel better at myself. Okay, <laughs> or, or worse, depending on how you how good you are. With yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm I'm enjoying many facets of exercise, whether whether it's athletics, whether it's just like long distance running, listening to a podcast, or smashing old people at CrossFit in random CrossFit gyms. Um, I just love sending it, uh, but. The more I do running and the and recently P being in weightlifting as well, I do think a hybrid approach is something I'm looking to pursue. Ooh, um, watch this space. Very good. Yeah, Very interesting. Good. interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Twiddle's moustache. I wish I had my moustache at this interesting. point. Interesting. I, uh, I do wish I did. But nonetheless, our abilities to solve crime are clearly profound. Mine is slightly inhibited at the moment as I don't have a... Yeah. beaver on my upper lip. <laughs> third eyebrow third eyebrow yours is an enormous third <laughs> eyebrow massive third mine eyebrow. is just absolutely thin, but it's very twirly whirly yeah, when it likes, to, likes to play ball but we are clearly going down a mustache shaped rabbit hole so we'll eject before we yeah. cause any damage and thank you all for listening engaging with the podcast sam it's been a pleasure you're a legend thank you and for having me. i look forward to seeing how everything continues to develop and with yourself thank you <laughs>